Rosalie, welcome to the ICA. I'm one of the curators here. Uh, really incredibly excited to be um, welcoming our speakers today, Hortense Spillers and Gail Lewis, who are in conversation. And we're also joined on, on stage at the moment by Kuga Majulu. Um, so this, uh, today's conversation is a primer for a large season we're doing here at the ICA this coming July, which is entitled Fugitive Feminism. Um, so this event is in collaboration with the Kugo, um, with whom we're drawing together a range of artists, academics and activists um, to explore contemporary black feminist politics. Um, Akuga will tell us a little bit more about the season, but um, it will include people like Sadia Hartman, performer Selena Thompson, and collective Yon Afro and Massey Collective, to name but a few. Um, Akugo's thought draws really heavily on that of Hortense and Gales, so Akugo has kindly uh, joined us today to present an introduction. So I will now introduce you, <laughs> Kugo. Uh, so Kugo is Professor of Sociology at the University of Warwick. Her research interests include investigating racial and gender inequalities in Europe and the US and exploring women of colour's grassroots activism for social justice. Kugo has co-authored Minority, Women and Austerity, Survival and Resistance in France and Britain. And she has a title forthcoming next year, uh, To Exist is to Resist Black Feminism in Europe. Akugo, can I pass over to you to introduce our speakers? Yes. So it's this weird, first of all, hello. Like, this is amazing. Like, it's Saturday. <laughs> and it's nice out. And you guys are in a windowless room. So anyway, just honestly, thank you so much. What a pleasure to, to be here. So we're having this weird thing where Rosie is introducing me, and I'm going to introduce Gail and Hortense, and so and then they'll introduce you guys or at some point. Anyway, so okay, what I was what I want to do just really briefly is give you a bit of background to the fugitive feminism season, and then I will um, introduce Gail and Hortense. So. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Hortense Spillers and, and Gail Lewis. This event is um, the, a primer for the to, um, to the season that Rosie was talking about um, called Fugitive Feminism, which is running from the 18th to the 22nd of July. So, um, and I think the program will be published next week, but mark that in your diary because it's going to be bananas. It's going to be really good. So, like, honestly, it's going to be... Yeah, if I do say so. Anyway, uh, <laughs> and I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about why I wanted to organize this program, um, because I wanted to try to better understand this phenomenon that I've been encountering in the field working on this project called The Politics of Catastrophe, and also my other project looking at women of color's anti-austerity activism. What I kept encountering was this issue of women of color activists undertaking creative and innovative work occupying prisons, doing uh, refugee uh, survival support, going to Jarlswood and supporting uh, migrant women locked up there. They're doing this work and for some reason cannot be seen as legitimate political actors. They're doing this work and cannot be seen as allies in struggle, can't be seen as can't be read as le 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 legible, sorry, it's hard for me to say. And I kept trying to figure out what was going on. Why was this happening? And of course, if you know anything about black feminism, none of this is surprising, right? Of to be erased from your own struggle, to be erased from your own knowledge production is part and parcel of what black feminist politics is. So it's the struggle to be seen and to be heard and to be represented. So that wasn't surprising to me. But nevertheless, it was puzzling that women of color con um, consistently confront the same issues despite the very different context in which they're working. So much of my, all of my work is comparative. And I do work in the United States, in Britain, in France, the Netherlands, and in Belgium, particularly in Francophone speaking Europe. I do a lot of work. And in these very, very different contexts where race is less available on the continent to talk um, as a means by which people make claims to the state and to other citizens, even in these very, very different contexts, women of color and black women in particular experience these same kind of issues. And that's where Horton Spillers comes in. Because Spillers helped me understand um, why women of color, but particularly black women, cannot be seen as legitimate subjects because the gendered subject is always already marked as white. And that to be a woman and to occupy the category of womanhood is an exclusive and excluding category. And its boundaries are jealously guarded through both epistemic and actually material real violence. And this is also where Gail Lewis comes in. 
because to understand this process, we have to, un we have, to have these transnational conversations. Because as you know, particularly in the black diaspora, the experiences of black American women dominate, which are very important. But these aren't the only experiences. And so what's really important is to understand how black women are, are de-gendered subjects, but we have to understand this beyond the particularities of the United States of America and explore the similarities and differences of gendered racial formation of once colonial subjects. And so the season of fugitive feminism seeks to explore what happens when black women abandon gender. What happens when we try to think without gender? And what happens when we try to embrace a transgressive category of the fugitive, one who flees the category of gender, flees the category of woman and womanhood and hegemonic forms of femininity? What happens when we flee that category? And how do we work together? How do we collectively build a different kind of liberation politics? So let me now introduce Hortense and Gail. Horton Spillers is the Gertrude Conaway Vanderbilt Professor in the English Department at Vanderbilt University. She co-edited co Conjuring, Black Women, Fiction, and Literary Tradition in 1985, along with Marjorie Priest, and edited Comparative American Identities, Race, Sex, and Nationality in the Modern Text in 1991. Spillers has also published the collection of essays, Black, White, and in Color, Essays on American Literature and Culture in 2003, which span the breadth of her professional interests in African American culture and history. Gail Lewis is reader in psychosocial studies at Birkbeck University, College, University of London. Her academic interests center on psychoanalysis, black feminism, experience as a site of knowing and knowledge production, and social policy and welfare practice. She has a mixed disciplinary background with a degree in social anthropology, an MPhil in development studies, and a PhD in sociology. Yeah, you're not messing around. So, <laughs> between, so, why, why the commentary? It's, it's not necessary. Anyway, so. <laughs> I apologize. Um, between two spells at the Open University, she worked at Lancaster University in the Institute of Women's Studies, where she was head of department. She's also a qualified psychodynamic psychotherapist. She published Race, Gender, and Social Policy, Encounters in Postcolonial Society in 2000. Her work has also appeared in Race and Class, Cultural Studies, European Journal of Women's Studies, Feminist Theory, Signs, and Feminist Review, where she recently published Questions of Presence in issue 117 um, in 2017. If you haven't read Questions of Presence, man, you, you are missing out because it is also bananas, as in good. So, <laughs> so what we want to, do, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to hand over to Gail, and they're going to enter into a conversation for about what time is it? For maybe about 90 minutes, perhaps. But we'll, we're going to play it by ear, and then we'll open up to questions. Okay, well maybe it'll be less than that. All right, okay, 30. You see, they were like 90 minutes. Are you? So we are going to play it by ear. Hortense is like, I'm. It's hot. I'm tired. I'm not doing that. So I'm sorry for scaring you. Okay, that won't happen. So, so we're going to um, open for that. They're going to have a conversation for a certain amount of time. And then we'll open up to questions from, from the audience. Um, and before I just hand over, I just want to thank uh, Rosie Dubal and Efenya Wachi for all their help in co-programming -pro today and also for the season. So I'm going to hand over to you, Gail. Well, first we're going to hand over to some music and then to yeah. Gail. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, everyone. It's really good to be here. I can't quite believe I'm sitting next to Hortense Spillers, who I'm a fan of. <laughs> and those of you who know me as an Arsenal fan know I know how to be a fan. <laughs> but it's because Hortense's work has just been so thought-provoking, so generative, so generous, that it opens a space for one's own mind to wander into and say, what do I think? Can I do this? I'm certainly given permission as a black woman by her, and maybe I can. So thank you for that, really. For those of you who don't know, that piece of music was from a very long track, it's 21 minutes by Cecil Taylor, called D-Trad That's What, 
from an album entitled Nefertiti, The Beautiful One Has Come. And it seems to me, as Cecil Taylor always does, he announces the terrain into which we must go. Ready or not, here we come. And it's because of the number of rhythms, the, the, the turbulences that he announces in his work, but the way in which he's always contemporary and always building on tradition. And that, it seems to me, is exactly the place that we are located as black women, women of color, feminists, who attempt to find a way to navigate the waters where we've drowned and from which we continually rise up from and take a deep breath as we swim through, navigate the waters in order to move towards what we feel we might become. And I think the music, so Nefertiti, the beautiful one, has come, is the album that you're all going to go and listen to on YouTube. <laughs> and remember that Cecil, just some libation, because he just passed recently. So, and also we really are gathering together on the right day, no? We've got the royals out there doing their stuff. We've got the fascists gathering and the anti-racist mobilizing. And we've got us in here in a dark space because we are navigating the waters through and between all of those, those formations. And it seems to me as well that we're in a, a particular moment, what I might call the kind of three Britons that we occupy right now. There's Brexit Britain and the fascists mobilize. And, every, and the appeal to white racism that Brexit Britain announces as both as, as a kind of social and cultural formation, but also as a psychic formation. You know, this is a call to, an, uh, or an attempt to kind of, Bre Brexit Britain kind of speaks to the need on the part of some, we're told, some who want to occupy the space of whiteness to redeem themselves through a fantasy of wholeness and a fantasy to reclaim the wholeness that none of us can have, alienated subjectivity, but nevertheless there is a fantasy of that. And we know that that's a fantasy located in a register of nostalgia for an imperial Britain. We're also, I think, there's another Britain in some senses which generates Brexit Britain, and that's kind of global Britain. The Britain that's organized through the, through, particularly through finance capital and its mobilizations, its locations. The way in which finance capital creates the borders of, of the nation and also that that is out with those borders while it goes around the world doing what it wants to, including, unfortunately, led by Premier League football. It's true, there's a fantastic article in the Financial Times from a few weeks ago, Liliane, you may remember when it was, but um, that really charts the way in which finance capital is using soccer to kind of low, sim, further cement its place. And that, that kind of global Britain is in some senses the very Britain that those who, some of those who voted Brexit were voting against. But there are, alongside that, and that's perhaps the spaces that we inhabit much more, the multiple diasporic Britons. The Britons of the undercommons, the Britons where we say, maybe we can be something else. Certainly we're gonna live our lives in an ordinary way, making claims to perhaps not the state. When I, was, when I worked in social policy, I used to think that Often we were making claims to the state for a kind of citizenship. And now I, know, don't know, I no longer know that that's right, or indeed is what we should do. But that's a, perhaps we can get into a conversation more about that. But certainly those diasporic Britons are the places through which we locate and navigate a kind of fugitivity. A fugitivity that sits in terms of saying, we will be this, we will do this, this is our lives, and it is neither straightforward resistance, but what it is certainly is a kind of 
refusal against the terms of normativity that you would inscribe our black and people of colour bodies through. So if I, in, and in some senses, I think this notion of Windrush generation is indeed certain people, is a generation, but the notion of Windrush generation acts as the placeholder for that struggle between these different kinds of capacities to be and claims to. So from that, I would like to maybe go to Hortense, because it seems to me, you can see I've located the beginning of our conversation in now and some suggestions about where I think we are as we sit here in the middle of London, in Britain. And I wondered if we could ask you, Hortense, to talk a bit about how you see now. And I'm partly driven towards that, that question, is because you were, you were a founder of the Feminist Wire, and then you retreated from that, I think it was around 2011, something like that. But more recently have started another journal called The A-Line, um, just in 2017. And in that, you, in your call for that, uh, or for participation in it, you say that we need a broader net across the cultural and political landscape by assuming a progressive stance that seeks to examine national and international issues from this perspective. You continue, this would include looking at the feminist movement but is not restricted to it. And I wondered if you could tell us a bit why you think it's so urgent that we go to the A-line and the broader, the larger stage. And what it is that if we focus on the feminist movement, what gets foreclosed in this moment? Oh, thank you very much for that, Gail. Uh, and let me start by thanking this wonderful audience uh, for being here today. Um, you could be a thousand other places, <laughs> but you've chosen uh, to come here. Uh, I want to uh, thank Rosalie and all the other colleagues responsible for extending this invitation to me to have the opportunity to come back to your wonderful city and to this beautiful venue. I've been here, uh, been in London many times, but I haven't been over here yet, and this is the first time, and I'm, I'm very glad uh, to be here and very glad to see you. The questions that uh, Gail raises and her response to them is, is, is rather like listening to a recording of something that's going on in your own mind, right? <laughs> I mean, it's like you took the thoughts right out of my mind and said them a lot better than, than, than I would say them. This idea of three Britons, a multi-diasporic Britain, a Brexit Britain, a global Britain. I mean, that. if I could just talk about that a moment, I can you go on please. and talk yeah. about the A-line. Talk about whatever. But I really like that. I arrived uh, late last night from Berlin. Actually, I've been on a little European jaunt. It hadn't been exactly a holiday because <laughs> it's been work involved in all of those places, starting with uh, Procida, Italy, one of those lovely islands off, uh, off Naples where the streets look like something out of a Flaubert novel. It's a perfect place for love trysts and <laughs> <laughs> secret meetings and duels. And it was a wonderful place to have a seminar. <laughs> In American studies. <laughs> so I was there with some, some colleagues from Orientala University uh, in, in Rome, and we were, we were having an American Studies seminar. And then I went from there to uh, Berlin. I went from Rome to Berlin, and a good friend of mine at home said it sounded like a James Bond novel <laughs> from Rome to Berlin, right? <laughs> and there was another uh, arts seminar there, another seminar in, in culture at the Free University uh, in Berlin, and I met somebody the other day who had just left London and the ICA, 
Uh, and I said, well, that's where I'm going. So it was an interesting conversation there. So, so here I am. I arrived at Stansted. Yep, Stansted. <laughs> Never heard of Stansted. <laughs> I understand you have five airports. I knew of only two. I learned of another one last night. And um, I just wondered which one of those Britons I'd landed in. I think it might have been the Brexit mm-hmm. Britain. You should tell them. <laughs> well, I, I thought that because I, I had a little act of microaggression from the man who was uh, looking at the passports. So, you know, your papers have to be in order, right? And I'm trying to get in your country, so I couldn't complain that he went to somebody who got in the line after I had lined up. uh, And I was asking Gail about that kind of thing uh, this morning. So I think we both agreed that that was probably a vote to exit uh, the uh, the union <laughs> anyway. <laughs> uh, the question uh, the questions that uh, Gail poses are, are, are very important ones. Uh, the reason why I wanted um, to do the A line, um, well, here's the truth of it, and you can't tell anybody I, I, I told you this, but the the, the co editor and I had a disagreement, right? At, in in short. And I thought, oh, okay, well, I'm not going to argue. I'm right. (laughs) You're wrong. I'm gone. And I did something else, right? And what what I wanted to do by talking about, speaking about, or uh, trying to address a broadening is that the urgency that I feel, and I am sure that I am not alone in feeling that, the urgency that I feel about the threat to the very ground of our existence, which is this planet that we share, is so threatened by selfishness and greed and all the depredations of of late capital that we know so much about and talk about quite a lot, that what we have to do now is take the knowledge that we have learned over the last 30 years or so with changes in the curriculum in the university that really started from street movement around war protest, uh, human and civil rights protest, the, the next feminist movement, that we have to take the knowledge uh, from those experiences and translate them into a full court press and hope that it's going to work uh, to try to uh, save life on this planet. And so in the interest of some larger goal like that, I thought that I would uh, try to put together as many willing heads and souls as I could find who would be willing uh, to write about various issues that concern us, but to have in the back of our minds at all times the environmental and ecological threats that we now have to add uh, to all the other injuries uh, that we that we feel, and so that was that was the primary uh, inspiration behind the journal. We're going into the third number of it, which will be a double a double number. We've done, uh, we've done two. We look forward to a fourth that will be devoted to the arts. In the current issue that I hope is going to come out in a couple of weeks, and as soon as I can get home, I will write my essay <laughs> for my own journal. We hope to come out um, before uh, the month of May is out. In that issue, there is an article from, uh, I'm sure a person that you all know here, Douglas Field, about the British University and certain crises in, uh, in, in, in the British system. And there's another, there's another piece 
too from from the UK. So we're we're open for business and hope we're doing uh, a business that's that's going to matter in some in some small way. I think um, the other thing that I had in mind was the extent to which what we think of as nightmares or uncomfortable sleeping, we have waked up to it. And, you know, it looks like in some ways, even though we're speaking uh, cross-culturally and, and, and across national borders, it's almost as if we inhabit a single world, those who see the world or read the world in, in a certain kind of way, so that the Brexit vote, was that last June, June before last? 2016. 2016. Looks like it was a prelude for the November vote, 2016, in the United States and what that brought. Something absolutely unbelievable to millions of us who uh, who live in the United States. And so the sense that we are suddenly in a kind of danger zone that uh, we really can't avoid, that we really have no respite from, was also a part of, of the sense of urgency that I felt in encouraging people to uh, let's come together and see if what what little bit we can do at uh, at this critical time. Mm -hmm. So, I was, so if that's the context, and um, my mind's going at the moment now to want, to, I won't go there, but I kind of in my head is the question. So, what's the relationship between what you say about Trump now <laughs> and your incredible irritation? with Obama in Destiny's Child that, mm, <laughs> that you yes. talk about in that Boundary 2 essay. Yeah. But, but maybe we'll come, come back to that because it raises uh, perhaps the question of the place of affect in politics. Because I know one of the things you were furious with Obama about was, come on, man, get up and show some anger here and yeah. declare a position in relation to racism. And don't, yeah. yeah, OK. Yeah. But... but Perhaps we can go first to thinking, if given the context that we feel we're in now, about that, go back to that question, that vexed question really, of the relationship between, on the one hand, the critical interventions that black women activists and scholars have made across a array of sites, including disciplines and theories, et cetera, and across, I know a term you don't, you're not keen on, the black Atlantic, because it collapses too much in a yeah. way but yeah. but but let's use that for the moment so the critical inter interventions on the one hand of that and the project of feminism which i think you agree and Saidia talks about Saidia hartman in the um what you're going to do revisiting mama's baby mm -hmm. it, conversation that was published in the women's studies international quarter quarterly and Saidia says there that she thinks that your project, especially in relation to how you show the ungendered character of the black body in Atlantic enslavement and its afterlife, but the, um, that, you're, that you're, you have a critical relation to the feminist project, but that your work can't be encompassed by that feminist project. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's still such an urgent question for us to think about in the light of the contemporary moment. Mm -hmm. And I wondered if you can tell us your thoughts about that. Yeah, the first thing that comes to my mind is that you people read a <laughs> lot of it. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, that's why we're here for you, we read you. <laughs> Destiny's Child, yes. Um. <laughs> You can see the writer in full yeah. irritation in Hortense's yeah. bit in that, and then in the conversation yeah. with some other colleagues. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You know, the thing that um, I think makes me very sad is that in, in some ways uh, the, work, the work of 
feminist revision, uh, racial revision or work on the racialized subject, that a lot of that, um, a lot of those projects have simply been absorbed, it seems to me. Um, it's as if they have uh, gone underground, that something has happened to that energy. And it looks like people are more and more devoted to, um, oh, I, 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 simply making a separate piece. I think that's, that's the right term for it. Making, making a separate piece with uh, the status quo or with things as they are. And I think some of that grows out of a kind of success mm. of these movements. Mm. There are very few institutions, as far as I can tell, in the United States that does not have some kind of program in women and gender studies. Mm. Very few institutions across the country that do not have some kind of program in uh, race studies, ethnic studies. So that in terms of transformations in the curricular objects, those movements have been powerful and successful at the same time that they have been contained by their success which is ironical, so that if you can place black faces, women's faces in positions of power, nothing necessarily changes. So that uh, I'm disappointed in that, but it might have been naive to have thought anything different was going to happen. And I think that was the impetus uh, to my irritation in the Destiny's, Destiny's Child piece, mm -hmm. that if you are running for the highest office in the land, there is a reason why you do that. Mm -hmm. It's because there's something you want to do. Mm -hmm. So that when you arrive in office, that is the beginning. It is not the end of anything. And what I was, uh, well, I was a little pissed off about this. <laughs> it, it, it seemed to me that um, the point in Mr. Obama's mind was to become the president, which was great that he became the president. But at the same time, you know, you think about a country that's uh, well over uh, a century old, and you wonder, well, why did it take you so long? So that why are you celebrating a first? So that... It irritated me that a certain population, including my own natal community, might have been overreading that, in my mind, as a kind of teleological closure, mm -hmm. that we have come to the end of something. And so I was thinking that all that historical apprenticeship, cultural apprenticeship, this is the end of it? We end in this moment? I don't think so. I think that should have been a point of departure. But it seemed to me to have been, in the minds of some people, the end of something. So that sense of a symbolic victory was, to my mind, a pyrrhic victory. Because what it did was disable criticism on the left. And you couldn't criticize because the right was doing that. I mean, those reactive, those ugly reactive forces burning the man in effigy and his family and, and all the rest of it, they were doing plenty of that. So that sort of disabled any honest criticism or disagreement that, that, that might have been coming from positions closer to uh, closer to his own
So I guess all of that is to say, in a larger sense, that we shouldn't take satisfaction or take rest in symbolic victories. And I'm kind of thinking that the forces of reaction know by now that if you can advance a face, just the face, that's all you have to do. I mean, for instance, there is or was a black woman, for example, running for mayor in the city of Nashville, who happens to be a colleague of mine at uh, Vanderbilt University. I can see a lot of people uh, voting uh, for that person who has really rotten ideas about everything. <laughs> it's absolutely everything. I wouldn't vote for this person to be the dog catcher <laughs> on my block. <laughs> Say nothing of the mayor of the city. Mm. And I can see if that woman had been successful, somebody running her for uh, a Senate seat in the state of Tennessee, which is exactly what's happening with one of the gubernatorial uh, campaigners is being embodied by uh, a woman whose ideas are white. This is a white woman in, in, in this case. Absolutely awful ideas. These people are beyond right wing. Hmm. I mean, these are dead and come back again. Like, <laughs> <laughs> these are throwbacks, <laughs> you know, atavistic <laughs> resurrections of really bad ideas. And you know, so you put so you put the face up, and people go, "Oh, yeah, this is very progressive." to have a woman, but if somebody, somebody said to me, and I'm gonna have to say something a little vulgar in order to get it out, mm. <laughs> the person said to me, okay, well the saying is, um, it's not the ass, but the seat. Does that make sense? That, that the seat is bigger than the butts that are in it, mm. and that that's what that's what we're trying to reform, right? And I think that's what we had in mind all the time. So that unless the people that we are talking about have some kind of progressive notion or redemptive notion of what living is all about, I don't think it's going to make much difference what, uh, what color they are mm. or what their sexual plumbing is. That's not going to make any difference at all. Well, I mean, what we're looking for, which takes us back to square one, right? I mean, we really circle back to, uh, to basics. And I think that things are bad enough now that we need, to, we need to reintroduce basics. Uh, and it's like going back to a place you know, but knowing it for the first time. I mean, we come back to those places now with the with the different understanding. And I think that's I think that's what that's what we're talking about. Mm. But I just wonder I mean I have to confess I cried when Obama got elected. <laughs> there was something that appealed to my sentiment. There's I can't deny that. And I didn't want to have to say, but why aren't you you know, I, it was difficult. So, a confession. Okay. Even while I know, every, everybody I know, well, no, all the black and people of color friends in the US tell me, Gail, get real. And mm -hmm. have the same position. So I know with this, but there was still something here, <laughs> I have to gotcha. say. Okay. You're uh, forgiven. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> It's okay. But, but, I, but I, I, <laughs> I do want, because I think people understand that, and of yeah. course that's precisely what should mobilise the political astuteness to say, hang on, check yourself now and talk with people to bring you into some kind of other, other critical eye, Space, that's yes. for sure. But yeah. I do just wonder, though, I want to come back because the importance of your notion of the black body as ungendered. 
and the role that that played, both in helping us to think precisely about the relationship between the enslaved body and the category the human, but also how we had to pay attention to that in relation if we were thinking about freedom and therefore what that might be in our imaginations as we tried to move towards it. And surely one of the effects of the hanging of the effigies of Obama and his family, the slogans that were everywhere, the constant mobilization, now the killings of black bodies by the mm -hmm. um, people, men and women th throughout the states. Surely that does exactly remind us. It was a reminder that whoever sat there, the forces would be mobilized against him and we would be reminded, both in the US and out with the US, mm -hmm. that this is what will happen to you if you become too uppity. So I think it, I, so I wanna come back to how might we use your notion of the ungendered now, or maybe un re-understand it in relation to the political challenges fa that we face on both sides of the Atlantic, if you like. Because mm. I don't think, as you say, they're not a million miles apart. They're specific, absolutely, and we need to grasp them, but some of the general contours mm -hmm. are shared, as they was ever thus, mm -hmm. really. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. Well, I, I, I think what I, would, um, what I would like to hear, Gail, mm. is how you would see that uh, ungendering effect. Uh, one thing that, uh, that I had in mind as you were mm. asking the question, because I think it's, 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 a, complicated, it's a complicated issue. Mm. One thing that I thought about uh, was something that uh, James Baldwin wrote many years ago. Mm. And Baldwin said, that um, to act is to be in danger. Mm. Mm. And I think that might have been somewhere in the fire next time, mm. to, act mm. is to, mm. to act is to be in danger. Mm. And I think, and it doesn't surprise me, and it shouldn't surprise anybody, that most of us act to avoid danger, mm. right? That we want to be committed, but we want to be committed in a way that's about uh, Sundays and happiness, and mm. you know, I I feel good about what I what I did, but to be but to accept the stakes of action and to be responsible for our action in in that way is a very frightening thing, and I think mm. I think we're in that moment. Mm. And I think one of the definitions for ungendering would be um, to accept whatever those stakes are in, in action, right? That one does not fall back on, on, one's, on one's gender, right? Or one's race or whatever it is that one can claim if if you've made a commitment to behave in the world in a certain kind of way, mm. or if you believe in certain ideas, at some point you may be, you may be summoned to do something about it. Mm. This is not only the test of leadership in relationship to our politicians and people who run things, but it is, it is in relationship to ourselves in the everyday world that we may be called upon at some time to do something that may endanger us if we believe the things that we say we believe. I mean, I've often wondered now that I'm older <laughs> if I, how fast I can run. Have you ever thought about that? <laughs> If you ever get in a situation, you know, I have a little arthritis uh, in knees and, and so forth, and that's, that compels you. But I think about that a lot. Mm. Mm. If you go to a demonstration and you are about to be 
arrested for something that you have stood up for, are you going to say to that cop, don't handcuff me in the back, handcuff me in the front? And the pain, if the cop does exactly what you do not want him to do. I think about stuff like that right now because I think um, we need to think about it. You need to think about that. Mm. I mean, what happens if Guantanamo Bay off Cuba is reactivated in uh, public policy or presidential policy in the United States in a regime that's unpredictable and anything could happen. So that's sort of, that has a little humor in it in relationship to myself and uh, the process of aging, but I often think about it. And I think that's what, um, that's why the kind of leadership that we're looking for uh, is lacking. That we want to appropriate the successes and the fruits and the good things, which means that we come out on the other side looking exactly like everybody else, if you know what I'm saying. Whereas that's not the point if we believe what we say we believe, that we are that we occupy positions in universities, that we occupy positions in cities and countries and towns and, and neighborhoods for a reason. And if it, is, if it is simply, if it goes like this, the system is rotten as long as I'm not in it. But as soon as I get in it and can reap some benefit from it, it's okay. And it seems to me that that's, that's the watchword or the order of the day. Whatever people might be saying about power, what they, what they are really doing once they get there is appropriating uh, the benefits of office. I think we're looking for something else. At least we say we are. Yeah? Um, so I'd, I'd, I'll respond to my th in terms of your question about my thoughts in a minute, but I just so recognize that thing about can I run anymore? Because I was at the British Library yesterday and they've got an exhibition on Windrush. I mean, it's, it's, it's so, br they've got an exhibition of Windrush and of Scott, Scott the Explorer, <laughs> you know, <laughs> side by side. Hey, this is where we live. <laughs> but, but in one of the photos, of Lewisham, 1977, there's Gail Lewis, a, a very young Gail Lewis standing there. And I remember that it, that was the time when I did get, later on when we went down to Lewisham High Street and we were running and the police caught me and they smashed, he smashed me, smashed my glasses, smashed me to the floor and all that. And I got arrested for, you know, threatening behavior or something like that kind of stuff. And I was thinking just yesterday, I couldn't run, you know, with two hip replacements, they may be working okay for walking, but certainly not for running, that's for sure. And I do think about what demonstrations I go on. And where I stand if I do. I really, I mean, I really do. And that then makes me feel kind of uncomfortable. And then I think, actually, no, I have to understand my bodily limitations in that sense, you know. But in, in terms of the question about, I, I, you see, I think that your ungendering notion is really helpful for us in Britain at this moment in relation to Windrush or the Windrush generation. And in my mind, I don't know whether it's right, but how I've, I've always used your ungendering is to make a distinction between ungendering and that that's not the same as not sexing, i.e. in the sense of being available for the reproduction of the stock, as it were. So the ungendered black woman's body is not, it's not that she can't reproduce, okay, in, in, in the conditions of enslavement as necessary. But I think that there are a number of ways in which we can see the complications of that ungendering as I've understood it right now in the moment. One is, is of course, the death of Sarah Reed. You know, we've got the video of her being beaten in the, in the police station and pulled in exactly the kinds of ways that you talk about. You know, this isn't a woman's body. 
and then some months later she dies in in while while incarcerated in Holloway prison apparently suicide but she's dead so we have an example of that through a, a death in custody but we also have it in relation let me just start by reminding people of something that Theresa May said on the Today program the Today program's on the radio 4 perhaps all it, even when you used to live here and stuff. And it's still the flagship new radio news programme, I think, anyway. And in 2013, in relation to the hostile environment question, she said, most people will say, you know, most British, the British public, will say it can't be fair. Now, let's stay with fairness, because we know, as Stuart told us, Stuart Hall told us in that piece that he did with Alan, I can't remember the guy's last name, about the role of the notion of fairness in neoliberal discourse here. So, it can't be fair for people who have no right to be here in the UK to continue to exist. Gets what we think about plantation records and the documentation, and it's through the record book, the slave ownership, okay. To continue to exist as everybody else does with bank accounts, with driving licenses, and with access to rented accommodation. So you cannot exist. You must be excised through all the bureaucratic ways in which and modes of govern, govern, governmentality in which you're brought into being. So she declares it in 2013. We know in 2000, was it in 13 or 14, when the buses, when the vans were going around the go home vans through the six, 14, yeah, okay, going around through six boroughs with big, saying go home. So threat, don't, don't be here. So on the one hand, we've got Sarah Reed, who shows us a real life example of an ungendered black woman's body. We've got the idea that you are alien and must go and you cannot be alive in any sense in which we come to citizenship aliveness through documentation. That is a mode of governance. And at the same time with Windrush and the generation, we've got the doubleness of that. We've got on the one hand, the reproductive because the people who are being deported or threatened with deportation are Done, do, being done so because they came in on their mother's passports. And then under the Patriality, you know, 71 was the Patriality Act. The one that said you have to be able to cast a line through blood. Apparently it was in Germany that they did blood with citizenship, not in Britain, but it was the Patriality Act to a grandparent to give you right to come in. And it's the 71 Act that they're caught under but it's through their mother's line. So she births, she reproduces, and in that sense, again, you know, absolute echo of the afterlife of enslavement, you take on what your mother, your, the, your, your status is that through your mother, she's not, she's not legal, you're not legal, and you don't have the documentation. Now, so you get the her, you get that notion of that split between the sexual sexual subject, the subject able to reproduce, mm -hmm. but not to pass on a capacity to a, with a right to live. You must not exist. Not just you must be deported. You must not exist. And I think the kind of NATO alienation, with a slight gesture to Patterson, but not only, that seems to be carried by. Your, the depth of your work on ungendering that helps us to see, even now in 2018 London, how this is, or Britain, how this makes sense. In a return of discourse of empire, really, and enslavement. So that's how I would see it now, anyway, you know. Mm -hmm. um, if you could explain a bit more about the 1971. So the 1971 71 Immigration Act, Act yeah. people might remember more. It was called the Patriot Patriality Act. And it, it was, in order to understand, there was always a parallel. So there was the 48 Nationality Act that apparently enabled all the people from the empire to come home. Mm -hmm. And then they did. June 1948, they arrived at 
wherever it was, Tilsbury or wherever. Okay, we're on the wind rush. Okay, but then gradually, as um, there was a need to, or the state thought there was a need to introduce two things, immigration control, so the first act in 62, always paralleled by a race relations act to govern civic life. So 62 Act, 65, 62 Immigration Act, 65 Race Relations Act, 68 Immigration Act, 68 Race Relations Amendment, 71, they can still come in, can't they? So 71 becomes a way to exclude on the basis of uh, being able to trace a line through to a British grandparent. So then you can begin to throw out. It's not about being having been a member of an empire or a commonwealth and holding a, sit, a passport as a citizen, or a subject, really, as a subject. It was being able to trace a line <coughs> through into, into Britain. And that began to announce the ways in which it would be tied to family and kin that would enable you to be here. And, yeah. That's surprising. I yeah. was not aware of yeah. that. Yeah. I was supposed to ask you something else, aren't I? I forgot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know what? I want, I, I kind of, I wanted to go to, the, actually, yeah, let me go. I wanted to ask you a bit in relation to your notion and your work on the idea of black culture. Because mm -hmm. it seems to be, again, a really important notion for us here. And then partly this is informed by, my own generational position as a particular generation of black feminist. Mm -hmm. Okay, where we were that generation that tried to really build something called a feminism and a, an anti-racist, what we came called critical race project mm -hmm. that was around the notion of black, where there was obviously a disconnection between morphology, by phenotype, and much more connected to a kind of common experience of the colonial. We are here because you were there. And that there could be any, anywhere that was part of the, the, the colonized thing. And we formed that notion of black, which was what we call political blackness. We, are, we, are, we located ourselves in the position of being black as an edge of criti cri criticism. And this is, this is 2018 Gail speaking now, rather than 1980. And I think what we were also doing was not just using that as a basis to make a claim on the British state and our location in welfare, but I think in a way we probably didn't understand it Maybe Stephen Ander did, I don't know. But we were also saying that the very notion of what it would mean to be British was challenged. So it wasn't just a claim to expand the notion of British, but actually maybe to destabilize it and reroute it, possibly. But that's me thinking now, in a, in a sense. Right. But, um, but, but that notion of black as an expansive category, mm -hmm but one from which there is challenge to the normativities, the ways of seeing, the ways of being mm -hmm. that was contained in that. Seems to me to be echoed a bit in your idea of black culture, mm -hmm. both in terms of what you write in the article, I haven't read the book, I've read the article, mm -hmm. but also in the lovely lecture at Waterloo, the University of Waterloo in Canada that's online. <laughs> And oh, you got it. You found it all. Uh, yeah, <laughs> but there's a lovely bit where you get into an extended conversation with one of the students, and it was mostly a white group, I think, at least who was yeah. yeah. And one of the students says, "But Professor Spillers, you said that black culture isn't about isn't collapsible into black mm -hmm. skin. Right. It's it's larger than that. Right. So what is it?" Mm -hmm. And, I'm, and I think that that feels so important, so I'd like you to say, what is it? Ah, I see. <laughs> okay. I'm still working on the book, by I the way. I know. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Right, right. I thought I couldn't find it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Cause it hadn't, it's not yeah. there yet. Yeah, it's yeah, yeah, yeah. But the article is. <laughs> and London is one of the cities in it. 
actually. Yeah. I've, I've been coming to um, to London here lately to, uh, to try to uh, just look around to mm. see what's going on with the point of view of of writing about London in addition to six other cities mm. in, in relationship to uh, the topic of, uh, of black culture. But what I had in mind there was that uh, black culture is critical culture. And that that particular aspect of it um, has been repressed precisely because of the stigma that is race connected. But precisely because one is stigmatized in a certain kind of way, one is, is forced uh, to see um, relationships of, uh, of power and, and inequity in a certain kind of way. And it is, that, it is that seeing, I believe, that breeds a critical stance. But a critical stance need not be limited, I think, to any particular, any particular shape or morphological factor. I think it is conceptual and uh, psychological. And that if one chooses, or if one ends up committed to um, a certain repertoire of, of ideas and behavior, one can certainly participate in my notion of, of black culture. All my life, my understanding of what the world is about comes out of that culture. And it, it was a culture that was always cut against the grain or against the bias. That was a position into which it was forced and it seems to me that in the best cases, people chose to do the, an alternative path. And to and to see what's going on around them. It's simply, I think, opening opening your eyes and reading relationships rather than falling into mysticisms around race and religion and nationality and all the other isms that uh, we surrender to. And so to and so to be critical, which I think is an act that does not end that it's across our lives uh, to be critical of uh, one's condition and circumstance and your understanding of what's generated the circumstance is what I, is what I mean by, by critical culture. I think it's what Marcuse mm -hmm. is arguing in, uh, in some of his work. And so it, it just it, it occurs to me that even though we talk about black culture as if it were isolatable along a number of isolatable stress points, that it's really a critical position taking when one is actively involved in it. And that in the end, anybody can, can appropriate that position. So that what I end up saying in the essay is that black culture is a future, that it has yet to come, that we are in the process of creating it. So that when people who are not morphologically or whatever it is we, we call black, Make a decision to be in the world in a certain kind of way, then they're 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 in they're in black culture too. Mm -hmm. That's that was the idea. Mm -hmm. That black culture has yet to come, mm -hmm. even though there are black people on earth. But that the culture has yet to come. That it's an unfinished project in that in that mm -hmm. sense. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. that's great because it takes us right into the next um, area that I was thinking about. It, precisely around futurity and <coughs> what this might mean, because it seems to me that the 
the you know the title of this is what's the title of this event again? <laughs> Feminism. Yeah. Yeah, that's what we did. But it was it was on the the blurb. It was something. It put together something like. Fugitive the, feminisms and the future? Is no, or the impossibility of black women's claim to womanhood, black feminist approaches. So we get black feminist, which is usually associated with something to do with concerns around gender, but in our hands it's concerns around the toxicity of race and racism, of course, but, but also about a kind of future orientation. And... Tina Camp, who's done that beautiful work on reading the, the pictures of Caribbean or West Indian uh, people in Birmingham in the 60s, and the way she reads them, those images. And she, 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 she poses this question, what does it mean for a black feminist to think about, consider, or concede the concept of black futurity? Yeah. Um, black feminist, the black feminist con conundrum of being captured by, accountable to, the historical impact of the Atlantic slave trade on the meaning of black womanhood in the Americas. So how do we think about that in that context? And it does seem to me that that issue of how do we, how do we take full cognizance of all of the registers, including absolutely essentially the psychic registers of capture mm -hmm. and being and rem remaining to be captured mm -hmm. at the same time as we gesture towards the making of something mm -hmm. to come. Yeah. You know, um, I've been thinking about that a lot mm. um, because it seems to me it's it's time to try to um, rethink certain positions uh, that we have taken over time. And I have I've come to uh, I've come to this conclusion, or this is what this is what I think about. Um, the ungendering formulation and ideas uh, related to it now. <laughs> that it is, it's an analytical device that made a certain discourse possible, mm -hmm. that makes a certain discursive intervention possible. It's a heuristic device, it's a conceptual framework, and I think it's very plausible in relationship to what I understand about the history of diasporic communities and people. Mm. But I think our reception of it has to be double. That we have to have a double vision or a double consciousness of it in this sense, that it is, it is a useful device on the one hand, but it need not be reified on the other, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. I mean, in other words, uh, we have to live our lives, <laughs> right? And if you, if you get stuck in the reification of an idea, then you cannot live your life progressively, you know? I mean, one day after the next one foot in front in front of the other so i think i think we have to observe it along um dual tracks that there's the theoretical and then there's the practical there's the conceptual and then there's the everyday world in which i must live my life and i think what happens say with the afro pessimist position mm -hmm. is that and i don't think this is an afro pessimist position even though the afro pessimists have claimed it <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> as a part of their position i think the afro pessimistic position really lands in reactionism mm -hmm. 
that it really lands in a kind of deadly conservative closure that we stop right here. And that's not what you want to do. I mean, you have to get beyond the stop signs, right? Mm -hmm. You come to a stop, boom, hit the brakes, and then, okay. And you take off again. And I think that's, I think that's what we have to do with our theorizing. Mm -hmm. That we have, to, we have to have the theories because they help us understand our relationship to other discourses that we both support and agree with and disagree with in in other cases that it you know it helps it helps a theoretical understanding which widens the world out and the way we see it all of that happens with theoretical tools but in addition to that and running parallel to it or concurrently with it is the need to get on uh, with our lives, mm -hmm. with what we know about the theoretical and about ideas, and so that's the way that's the way I would read that. Mm -hmm. That I would not I would not want to see a reification or a reading it back into my own historical subjectivity or subjecthood as though it exhausted mm -hmm. my possibilities. Right, because it does not. I mean, it certainly defines how I am situated in the world that calls me by my name, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or by whatever other name it, it's mm -hmm. it's calling me, and I have to answer mm -hmm. to all of them, whether I like them or not, and to try to be responsible mm -hmm. to them. But I'm not exhausted by that, mm -hmm. right? I'm 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 that plus. Mm -hmm. And so it's the plus that I'm trying to get to, and that's that's what I mean when I talk about a, a duality or a dual track understanding of our relationship to uh, the theoretical. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, so it's like Nina Simone says, "I'm on the the left hand finally got going." Like you need more than one. Yeah, <laughs> yeah <laughs> on one of the yeah, um, and that's beautiful actually because one of the things I was th uh, I, I wanted to say really was was when I was looking back over your work for today, and I was thinking, you know what, Gail? Kind of, I think what what Hortense's work does is produce a kind of topological formation. You know, you give us the shapes of space. You know, not it's not just it's not a cartography in the straightforward way, but there's something much more about the production of it or showing us how to think about plot the shapes of space, how to, to do work topologically, in a sense. And where did that come so beautifully? And those of you who, well, everyone in the room, of course, has read the essays. But the opening, the opening um, one, the introduction, Peter's Pans, Eating in the Diaspora. And the last section is all about food and eating. And one of the things that Hortense says in that, she says, the trick nevertheless is that the shadow does not always fall where we think it might. With food then, we are both at home and abroad, a product of a particular urban block or a spot of provincial countryside and a worldling of multi-languages and cultures. Mm -hmm. I see no need to choose. And it's, it seemed to me that what you were really announcing there was precisely that we have the possibility of creating or seeing the trace of and then expanding these different spaces of location mm -hmm. through which we might act and form a politics across a range of relational positions. Mm -hmm. And how do you show us that? She tells us that Hopping John, which I know as Rice and Peas, <laughs> where did she have the best Hopping John? Now, if you think of the map of London and you think of Black Presence, you're not going to think Fulham. <laughs> she tells us she had the best 
pop in John Rice and yeah. peas and tells us about the coconut milk and all the things we must and how we must absolutely know when to put the rice into the peas and so that you know everything stands the grains are, are separate Stand but the well. peas don't mush yeah. and we can still taste the coconut and I always put a little bit of chili with mine and there's a whole section in that about peppers and the different but here we have another map of London in other words through eating the diaspora it seems to me and thinking about the relationships that we get a kind of vision of a topological space in which we might imagine ourselves precisely in the sense of a black culture to come. Mm -hmm. That is beautiful. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Boy, that's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's really, I really appreciate that. It's, that's a, a moving reading of, uh, <laughs> of that essay. You know, I lived in, in London in, in 69. <laughs> My parents thought I was... I was in graduate school, and I had taken a leave. But my, what my parents didn't know was that I had come over here to get married, actually. <laughs> and I told them about it later. But um, I, was, I, was, I was going to uh, marry um, a man from uh, Jamaica and, and possibly live in London. Well, the relationship didn't work out and I went back to <laughs> back to graduate school. But in that six months, I learned how to make Jamaican fried chicken <laughs> uh, because my partner knew how to do that and taught me how to make it. And so that's where the, that's where the Poppin' John comes from. It was a gateway to quite a lot. I think, it, I think of it as my own individual modernity. <laughs> I learned what the Caribbean was. Mm. I mean, I knew in my head, but I learned in my heart and on my feet as uh, someone who was a stenographer for a few weeks at the Society of Radiographers on Upper Wimple Street in London and had my first uh, fish and chips. <laughs> <laughs> Here in London, so I learned. I learned all of that. I had my first passport, uh, my first understanding of uh, what the diaspora actually looked like, as someone who visited uh, the West Indian Student Center often, where students from sub-Saharan African countries and from the Caribbean and from time to time the United States. Uh, converged mm -hmm. mostly from the Caribbean and sub-Saharan African countries. So I learned, uh, I learned quite a lot about quite a lot of things and I think of food as uh, the metaphor mm -hmm. that, uh, that defined it. So this has been uh, a very important uh, city for me and the things I learned here many years ago. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that was that that essay was really a kind of kind of tribute to yeah. that uh, to yeah. that learning. Yeah. yeah. So we're going to hand over now. I just want to say um, uh, one thing, and the way in which I think to bring us back to this theme about where are the spaces through which a kind of fugitivity of black feminist black womanhood might be emerging and one of the ways we can think about that is also in relation to food and in, in the way that Hortense talks about it because she says when she's learned to made, make a re recipe and she knows how to do it is when she's forgotten the recipe and can just do it and I think if that's not a metaphor to forget the recipe of womanhood and do it how we might do it fugitively so I think we're going to open up now thank you Great.